Greetings! You've reached Programming on Purpose with Python, the 10th in our series of narrated slides. And here we're going to add a GUI to the web scraper we developed in the previous slideshow. My name is Mike Callahan and I'm a STEM educator. So what we're going to do is we're basically going to finish the application we started in the previous slideshow. This is going to be all about the graphical user interface, or the GUI, and we're going to learn about new widgets, ledgers, menus, progress bars, open dialogues, and message dialogues. We're also going to learn about a new function called enumerate, and you're going to see how to use the else block in a for loop. This slideshow needs TK Intertoy version 1.3 or later. The previous versions, after I used it, I decided that I needed to upgrade the library to make it easier to write GUIs. So if you're using an old version of TK Intertoy, you need to upgrade it. It's actually quite easy to do that. All you have to do is right click on the start window of Windows and select Windows PowerShell Admin. Then just type PY, which is the way you get to Python from the command line, PY minus M. Minus M means that you're going to execute a uh, module. So it's PY minus M pip install dash dash upgrade TK enter toy and so what this will do is it will actually go into the TK enter toy that is in your computer and upgrade it to version 1.3 now this next is completely optional and it is a bit involved but if it's been bothering you that idle can't scroll horizontally, this is how to fix it. First of all, you're going to have to go into your installation of Python and in the library subdirectory it's marked as read only and you're going to have to remove that. Then bring up idle and open this file. It's under Python 3.8 lib idle lib editor.py. Now you want to make a backup copy because if you mess things up you will destroy idle and you'll have to reinstall Python 3.8 which is not the biggest thing in the world really. But going ahead in the editor window of the init method you're going to add four lines and this is for uh, Python 3.8 and it occurs around one line 125 right underneath self.vbar you will put self.hbar equals hbar equals the scroll bar text frame orient equals horizontal name equals hbar so you can see it's very similar to the previous line except for you have a horizontal scroll bar. Then skipping on down past the text y scroll command on lines around 216 you'll just basically duplicate those previous three lines instead of v bar you'll put h bar so it's h bar command equals and notice uh, the vbar command it's a special method and the reason why they had to do that is for the line numbers which was added in Python 3.8 well you don't have line numbers horizontally so you just do self.text.xview and then the other ones you're going to do hbar grid row 2 column 1 sticky north south east west and then text equals x scroll command equals h bar dot set 
So those three lines will give you a horizontal scroller. And like I said, if you're not brave, uh, don't worry about this. So now it's time to design our GUI. So we're going to introduce widgets from TK Entertoy, the ledger, the menus, and progress bars, and then we're also going to introduce these pop-up dialog windows. So here is our design, and you can see it looks kind of like a standard Windows type program. We're going to have a file menu, and under the file menu there's going to be the open command and exit. We're going to have a help menu, which only thing under that will be about. And then where we actually see our items, that's going to be a ledger, and we'll see how to use that. And as the program is collecting information from the web pages, you'll see a little progress bar at the bottom. So let's get to work. So our GUI class, almost all the actions will occur in these methods. We are going to have an init method, and that's going to create the instance attributes. We're going to have a make GUI method, which will create the GUI and start the event loop. We're going to have a make menus, which will create the menus for the GUI. Menus are a little complex, and so it's probably a good idea to remove them out of the make GUI method, just to keep things simple. We're going to have an open method, which will get the desired CSV file from the user, open the file, and start the polling. We're going to have a check method to make sure that that CSV file that the user sent us is correct. We're going to have the start method, which will start polling servers for information. We're going to have an about method, which will pop up an about dialog. And of course, we want to exit, so we'll have an exit method that will exit the application. Our class variables, we're going to use that for all the dimensions of the application. And the reason why I put them here is because this might be something that you want to play with. So we have height equals 20, and the ledger columns site is going to be 80 pixels wide, item is going to be 500 pixels wide, and price is going to be 100 pixels wide. Notice height is characters, columns are pixels. And the progress length bar, that's also in pixels, 200 pixels wide. And these are numbers you can play with, so if you don't like the looks of this particular application. It's very easy to go in there and change them. The init method, first of all we're going to pass an instance of the scraper class because we're going to need that and because multiple methods will be accessing that scraper class. So we uh, create the instance of the scraper class and that was actually sent to the call as an argument. And we'll see how that works when we get to the main. We also need two more attributes. Work list will hold the contents of the opened CSV file. Output will hold the contents of the ledger. Both of these are lists, and we're going to use our new method of creating lists. So we have our init done, then we call make the GUI. And there is our init method. Again, most init methods are usually pretty short and straightforward. So now it's time to write the make GUI method all the GUI creation code will be here. It's going to start out with creating a TK Entertoy window, titling it, cre uh, 
creating the ledger, creating the progress bar, plotting the widgets, making the menus, and starting the event loop. We have documented our new method and our first line is we're going to use self.win equals window. This will create a TK Intertoy window object. The next line is we're going to title that window with self.win.setTitle Web Scraper version 1. Our ledger is not going to use the standard font. We want one that's a little bit larger. So we're going to have to create a style. Ledgers are actually derived from TTK Tree View. But for some reason, you don't use T Tree View in the style tags like you do with other objects. Anyway, our two lines of code is we want to declare our font and we're going to use a 12-point font. And then we're going to add the style, f.treeView. Again, capital T, but no double T. And font equals font. So uh, we have our style for our ledger defined. Let's add the ledger. It's the add ledger method, the tag, and the height. That's the number of characters, not pixels. But the column is column headers and width in pixels. A little bit confusing. Height is characters, width is pixels. And then a possible prompt. And then the optional TK parms, which we're going to take advantage for our style argument. We're also going to take advantage of the TK Intertoy 1.3 feature that returns the object. So we're going to need this object pretty quickly. So we have ledger equals self.win.addLedger. Our tag is going to be ledger. It's going to be 20 characters high. Our columns, that's going to be that class variable, GUI.Columns. And the style, f.treeView, which we just created the line before at. The reason why we needed the ledger is because we're going to have to change one of the columns in the ledger. In order to have those decimals line up, we have to set the price column to the east, which is a E, anchor, which will write justify. So we're taking advantage of that feature of an add widget in TK Enter Toy 1.3 that returned the widget. So we already have our widget. All we have to do is apply the column method using the argument of 2. Remember, this is the third column. We count from 0, so that would be column index 2 with anchor equal to that E, and it's a string. The progress bar is very similar. Add progress, a tag, the length, which is in pixels, a possible prompt, the orient, and that can either be horizontal or vertical, but progress bars default to horizontal, and then the optional TK parms. Our case, it's self.win.addProgress. Our tag is just progress. The progress length is going to be that class variable, GUI.progressLength. And we're going to have our title of our frame as Pulling Progress. So we have our two widgets. We only have one column. So the plotting is going to be very simple. You plot the ledger in row 0 and the progress bar in row 1. Now it's time to make the menus. But again, the menus are fairly complex, so we're going to move that code into its own method, make menus. So we're just going to call self.makeMenus. And last, we want to start our event loop, so we're going to use our old friend, waitforUser, self.win.waitforUser. This is our makeGUI method. 
If you've fallen behind, here's a great chance to get caught up with your typing. Menus are very common in desktop applications, maybe not so much in cell phone applications, but it's a great way of organizing commands into an easy to use structure that doesn't take up a lot of space. In our case, we're going to create two menus, a file menu which will have an open and exit command, and a help menu which will have an about command. Notice with our application we are not going to have command buttons, the menus are going to replace those. Menus can be complex, so we are just going to limit ourselves to just creating menus for these tasks. Creating a main menu, we have a bit of a chicken and an egg problem here. So we're going to start with an egg. We're going to add an empty main menu to the main window. Then we're going to create the two cascading menus, which will be File and Help. We're going to add these to the main menu. Then we're going to connect the main menu to the main window's menus attribute and we'll see how all this works. The add menu method is pretty straightforward. You just say add menu with that tag. Again, almost every object in TK Intertoy has a tag. Then you have the parent, what the menu is attached to. It could be a frame, a menu, or something called a menu button. Then the items. That's a list of the items for the menu. And the list is broken up into a list of lists with each list having two elements, first being a type and the X being C options, which is actually a dictionary. The type is one of either cascade, check button, command, radio button, or separator. Adding an empty menu is pretty straightforward. The parent is going to be the application window. But we're going to need this menu, so we're going to again take advantage of that feature of TK Intertoy 1.3 and return the object that it creates and store that in a local variable. And since this menu is empty, the items will be left off. So the code is simply main equals self dot win dot add menu. Our tag is main menu, and our parent is self dot win dot master. The items lists are lists with that string element followed by dictionary elements. In a review, the first element is either command, cascade, check button, radio button, or separator. So the file menu, we're going to start with a list. Then we're going to have two elements in that list, and that those elements will also be lists. In the first element, it will be first item is a command, the string, and then our dictionary of the C options. In this case, it is the label will be open, and the command will be self.open and we close our dictionary, and we close our list. Notice that self.open hasn't been written yet, but that's okay, you can do that at this phase. The second one will be the command with the label of exit, and the command is self.exit. The help menu is very straightforward, it's just a list of lists with one element, command, label of about, and the command is self.about. Be careful when you type these lines to make sure that your, your brackets and your braces all line up and you have your colons and your commas in the right places. So we've created the items. We have to now create menus based on those items. And we're going to need these menus, so first one is 
file m, that's going to be the file menu, equals self.win.addMenu, and its tag is going to be file menu. Its parent is going to be the main menu, just main, and the items is going to be that file menu that we just saw above. Same thing for help. Self.win.addMenu, help menu is the tag, parent is main, and the help menu items that we created above that. Now we have created these two cascading menus. Even though their parent is main, that does not attach them to the main menu. You actually have to use an add method. So it's main.add, and we're going to add a cascade. The label is file, and the menu is going to be the file m. And the same thing for help, where the menu is help m. So I want you to pause here for a second and look at the difference between the f menu items, actually creating the cascading menus, and then adding them to the main menu. Now normally cascading menus would be connected to uh, another menu, but this is the main menu and we want these cascades to go at the top of the window. So the way you do that is with this command, self.win.master of menu. That's basically the menu attribute of the master window, and you just set it equal to the main menu. And here is our complete make menus method. Again, it's a little different, but I think if you uh, stare at this, you can see what's going on. It's time for the open method. This is really going to be doing a lot of the work. This method will contain the code for reading the CSV files. However, rather than hand a file name to this method, we're going to let the user select the file name by using standard open file dialogs. And that's the reason why in our reader.read method we didn't need to trap for missing files. This method is only going to send files that exist. So we create the parameters we need for the file open dialog to look at only CSV files. Then we display the file open dialog. If the user selects a file, we're going to create a reader instance and read the CSV file. Once we've read it into our memory, we're going to check it. Because there's no sense in starting to poll servers if the file is incorrect. If it's not correct, then we're going to pop up an error message, let the user know that they need to fix that particular CSV file, and then we're just going to return. If it does pass the check, then we're going to clear output, we're going to copy the data from work list to output, and then we're going to update the ledger with information from output. Then we're going to start polling the servers. To pop up an open dialog box, you just use the pop open method. Now there's lots of commands, optional commands that can go in, into this method. We're just going to look at a few. Default extension, that's just basically a string that has the extension added to the file name. Must start with a period, of course. The file types, this is what we're going to be using. This limits the open dialog to only looking at a particular class of files. The initial directory, this is the initial directory uh, that the dialog pops open. There is an interesting feature of this one. If you make the initial directory a space, it will remember the last directory. Then the initial file, if you want to have a default file name that the user doesn't have to type in, you can put it here. And of course the title of the pop-up window. 
The file type argument we're going to take advantage of. This is where you can list all kinds of patterns to different types of files you want to limit the open to. In our case, we just want to have one extension, .csv. So it's a list of lists with only has one element in it. And the, the two items in the single element are the string CSV files, that's for the user, and dot CSV, that's for the computer. Here is an example of what that's going to look like. So we have our code and we're going to want the file name that the user clicks on. So that's going to go into our variable fname. So it's fname equals self.when.pop open. The title we're going to call it open CSV file. The file types are the files that you just saw in the previous slide and that initial directory we're going to make it that space to take advantage of that feature. If you look down below that code you can see what our open file log dialog is going to look like. In this case we have two CSV files, one called items and one called garbage. If the user selected the file then that method will return the file name as a string. If not, none will be returned. So we can take advantage of this by just saying if fname colon, again don't forget that colon, the indented code will be the part if a proper file name was selected. We're going to do reader of fname and this is the only place that the reader class is going to be used. So we're not going to make it an attribute of the instance. It's just going to be in this one method. Here's where we read in the CSV file. We're going to stick the results into work list, which is an attribute of the instance. So other methods will see this. Now we're going to check it. Check will return either true or false. Yes, I know we haven't written it yet, but that's okay. So if not check, that means the file is no good. And so we need to put out an error message. To pop up the error message, we're just going to use pop message. And it's pretty straightforward. Pop message what you want the message to be, what type of message this is going to be, and show info is the default, but you can do show warning, show error, ask yes or no, ask OK or cancel, or ask retry cancel. We're going to use show error, of course, and the title of the window. And you can also have optional TK parameters. In our case, we're just going to want self.when.pop message, and our message is going to be the CSV file is incorrect. And because this is a show error, it pops up the box like you see above there with a big red X in the case of Windows. And the title is simply going to be error. So if this is the case, then we're going to pop up that message, wait for the user to click on OK, and then we're just going to return. Otherwise, if self.check is true, then it's just going to go down to the next line of code, self.output clear. That's going to wipe out any previous information we had in that list. Now it's time for our loop and you can see this is pretty similar to what we had in our old main except for instead of writing it we're going to be appending it to output so for item in self dot work list then self dot output dot append and we're just going to append the three items item of site item of name 
and then a blank. That's going to be the price, and since we don't know what the price is, we're just going to leave it a blank. Once we filled out output the way we want it, now we're going to make output reflect into the ledger. The way you do that is with self.win.set and the tag is ledger. The source is going to be self.output and normally when you call set it only sets the next line. We want to set all the lines so that's why the all values equals true. So this will update the ledger to whatever is in output. Finally, we want to start polling sites, and that's another method which we haven't written yet called self.start. And here is the complete open method. If you got a little bit behind, here's a good chance to get caught up. Pay special attention to the indentations. They are very important in this code. The check method is going to be pretty straightforward. We're going to check two things. First of all, is the site either Amazon or Walmart? And that there are three elements per item. We're going to have a result flag and we're going to start out with that set to false. Then for every line in the work list, we're going to check the site name and the number of elements. If it's bad, we're going to break out of the loop. If there were no breaks, then we're going to have result set to true. If there are no breaks, that means we got through all the items and they were fine. Regardless, then we're going to return result. Step three, there's a nice feature of for loops that we're going to take advantage of. We create our method and we set result to false. And we set up our loop for item in self.worklist. We're going to check the site and the elements. The site must be in scraper.url head. And remember that site name is the key. And then each item must have three elements, the site, the name, and the key. If there is an error, we're just going to break. So the code is simply, if item of site is not in scraper.url head, or the length of item is not equal to three, break. And here's where we're going to take advantage of the else clause and for loops. If we get through all the items, then we didn't break. That means then the else clause will execute. Now else is a strange word. It really doesn't fit here. So for for loops, if you want to use an else clause, think in the back of your mind, if no break. Then it may is clear. In any case, if we have no break, we want the result to be true. And our last line is return the result. And that's check. It's time for the start method. This is going to do the web fetching and the regular expression. We're also going to take advantage of a new widget, the progress bar, and we're going to learn how to use it. You're going to recognize a lot of this code because it was be the coming from the main in the old version. The steps for the start method, we're going to calculate the interval for the progress bar. That's going to be based on the number of items in the list. Then once we have that, for each item in self.worklist, we're going to get the HTML from the web page, search for the price, update the output with the price, 
then update the ledger with that price using the output then we're going to update the progress bar do our delay between one and three seconds and then once everything is completed we're going to reset the progress bar back to zero we create our new method and here's where you do the interval for the progress bar. The interval actually is based on kind of a percentage so it's just the number of items that are in the self.output and you take that and divide 100 by it. So it's 100 divided by the length of self.output. That's our interval. Now we're going to learn a new function. It's called enumerate. It's built in, so you don't have to import anything. It's very useful. Many times we need to enumerate, which is a fancy word for count, elements in a sequence. So let's go to the shell and play with this particular function. We're going to create a list called a list, and it's going to be equal to three colors. I did red, white, and blue. Now we're going to apply enumerate to a list and then we're going to take that and turn it into a list. So what that does is it comes up with a list of lists, actually a list of tuples, where it assigns zero to red, one to white, and two to blue. you can see how useful this little function is. So taking advantage of this fact we're going to set up another for loop which has two variables n and color and we're going to enumerate a list again and this time we're going to be a little bit fancier with our output we're going to say print color number place mark is place mark where our arguments the format is going to be n and color. Running this we get color number 0 is red, color number 1 is white, color number 2 is blue. So I hope with this example you can see how enumerate works. So we're going to take advantage of enumerate in our loop here we're going to say for n comma item and enumerate of self dot work list so what that's going to do is it's going to create a list. The first element is going to be n and then it's going to have the dictionary for that particular line. Site, site name, name, name of the item, key, web key. And it's going to repeat that for each item. So we want the HTML from that website, so we're going to use self.scraper.getHTML. The arguments are item of site and item of key. If you notice, that line came right from the old main. Then we're going to check for the price. If HTML, if it exists, then we're going to try to get the price else we're going to say, oh, that's a server error. Again, this code was moved from main. Now we want to out update output with the price. And in particular, we want to mess with the third column, which is going to have an index of 2, is where the price location is. So it's just simply self.output of n of 2, put the price in there. Now you can see that line is very similar to what we had earlier. We're going to simply update ledger to whatever self.output contains. But this time, the price will be added. Now we're going to update the progress bar. Remember, enumerate starts at 0, so we're going to actually want to take n plus 1 
and then we're going to multiply it times that interval. So let's pretend there were five items in self.worklist. Our interval would be 20, because 100 divided by 5 is 20. So you would see win.set, so the first one value would be 20, the second one would be 40, and so on and so forth, up to 100. And that's how a progress bar works. Here's our delay, one to three seconds. Again, that code was just lifted from main. And resetting the progress bar back to zero is just self.win.set progress to zero. And there is start. The about method is quite simple. We're just going to pop up an about dialog. And this is a place where you can place information about your particular application, the version number, release date, stuff about you if you want to, whatever you want to stick in there, you can stick into a dialog box. It's a very simple method. Our message, we're just going to say web scraper version 1. And backslash n means new line. So we're going to kind of try to center things. So I have a space in there. My name and the date and other information. You can fill this in any way you want. So the pop up the box is just self.wem pop message. Remember, it's very similar to what we had before, except this time our message is just going to be the variable message. And it's going to default to show info. And the title is about web scraper. Time for the exit method. Well, this is probably the simplest method of all. You just call self.win.cancel. Here is the entire GUI class. Hopefully, your code looks very similar to this. If you got behind, again, here is a fantastic place to get caught up. The main function, since we've moved most of it out of it and up into the code, there's hardly anything left. You only have to add one line, app equals GUI of web. That's it. That's quite common for GUI-driven applications to have very simple mains. We test it, and we have success. You can see on this particular day, Walmart matched Amazon for the Roku Ultra me Streaming Media Player. Now one thing I want to caution you, servers will become suspicious of getting hit frequently. Here's a particular attack called a denial of service and that's how it works. So if you keep hitting the server continuously, then it's possible you might get turned off. They know what IP address you're coming from. So I wouldn't use this more than a few times a day just to be on the safe side. Wow! We have a very useful application that can be expanded to other websites. Again, as long as the price is included as static HTML. You also learned a lot about some widgets, the ledger, the menu, progress bars, file open dialogs, and message dialogs. And you learned how to use our new little function, enumerate, and you also learned how to take advantage of the else clause in a for loop. Our next application will be a presentation trivia program. And we're going to learn how to display photos, sound files, and a little bit more about some GUI widgets. We're also going to learn how to parse files 
that will build unique trivia games. It should be a lot of fun. As always, TK Intertoy is hosted at PyPy, and the documentation can be found at Read the Docs. But the easiest way to get to it is just Google TK Intertoy. So if you live in or near southern Indiana or Louisville, Kentucky, I teach two-hour free seminars at both the Jeffersonville and the New Albany Public Libraries. So if you're interested in getting some live training where well, we will go through these slides, uh, just simply call or go online to reserve your spot. Thank you for listening. If you're enjoying these slideshows, be sure you use subscribe and tell your friends if they want to learn how to code in Python. Until next time, happy coding!